Amen. 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 Thanks, guys. I want to invite you all to open your Bibles to Psalm 110. If you're here with us or if you're at home, it is, um, it is so vital to have a, have a copy of God's Word open and in, in front of you. And so we're, we're in the midst, if you're, if you're tuning in for the first time or here for the first time, we're doing a, we've been doing a series called Summer in the Psalms. And so we've been, throughout the summer, uh, we've been looking at various psalms. And today we're going to look at Psalm 110. So find that uh, in your copy of God's Word or, or, or click there uh, in your iPad or whatever you're using uh, this morning. Let's look at the 110th Psalm. And what we see here is just a beautiful portrait, a majestic portrait of who Jesus is as our king, as our priest, and as our warrior. Psalm 110, and let's look at the whole psalm uh, together. The 110th Psalm. Follow along in in your copy of God's Word. And this is a psalm of, of David. And he says, beginning in verse 1, This is the declaration of the Lord to my Lord. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. Rule over your surrounding enemies. Your people will volunteer on your day of battle. In holy splendor from the womb of the dawn, the dew of your youth belongs to you. The Lord has sworn an oath and will not take it back. You are a priest forever according to the pattern of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his anger. He will judge the nations, heaping up corpses. He will crush leaders over the entire world. He will drink from the brook by the road. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Let's pray together. Father, as we prepare to dig into your word right now, we pray that you would prepare our hearts, whether we're here in this room or whether we're, we're watching on video, we, we pray that you would do things during this time that, that only you can do. We need you. And we, we pray that you would take your word now and by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would change us, that we might go forth and be your agents of change in a world that so desperately needs you. We pray that, that as Christ is, is lifted up through this psalm that we would be drawn closer to him. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Of all the psalms, the psalm that we just read is the psalm that is quoted the most in the New Testament. In fact, not only is Psalm 110 quoted more than any other psalm in the New Testament, but Psalm 110 One is the most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament. And that is not surprising because at the center of the New Testament is Jesus. (laughs) And at the center of this psalm is Jesus. And what we see in Psalm 110 is a majestic portrait of Christ. Christ the king, Christ the priest, and Christ the warrior. We're going to look at all three this morning. First of all, we see in Psalm 110, Christ the king. So Psalm 110 is a royal psalm. Now, we we looked at another royal psalm earlier in the series when we looked at Psalm 2. So royal psalms are are psalms that that have to do with kings. And typically, what you see in a royal psalm is you'll see something called enthronement oracles. They were words that were said over a king when he would come to to, to power at at the ceremony 
where he became king, these enthronement oracles would be spoken over him. Well, Psalm 110 contains enthronement oracles as well, two of them. But the things that we see in these enthronement oracles in Psalm 110 are not things that would be said over a mere human king. They are enthronement oracles that are spoken over the king of kings, over Jesus. So let's look, beginning with verse 1. This is the declaration of the Lord to my Lord. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now literally what these opening words say in verse 1 is this is the oracle of Yahweh to my Lord. You see in, in verse 1, when you see the first use of the word Lord here, it's in all caps. So when you're reading the Old Testament and you see Lord in all caps, that's a clue that it's talking about Yahweh. And so what we're seeing here is, is that God the Father is making this declaration over Jesus, over his Son, David says, this is the declaration of the Lord, Yahweh, to my Lord. So this is the Father is speaking this enthronement oracle over his son, over Jesus. And what does he say? He says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So Jesus has just ascended into heaven. He has come and lived the perfect life that we could never live. He has gone to the cross and died for sinners on the cross. He has been raised from the dead. And then what happened? He ascended to the right hand of, of God the Father. And so the, the words here, that the Father is, is speaking over the Son occur just after Christ has ascended into heaven, after his resurrection. He has ascended to glory to the right hand of the Father, and the Father is speaking this enthronement oracle over his Son. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now soon after, this enthronement ceremony takes place in heaven after Christ's ascension. What happens here on earth? The Holy Spirit is poured out and the early Christians begin to preach the gospel. And as the early Christians begin to preach the gospel, we see them referring to Psalm 110.1 over and over and over again. In fact, we see it at the very day of Pentecost when Peter stands to, to preach on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. What does he say? Let's, let's look at Acts 2 and verses 32 and following. This is Peter's sermon at Pentecost. And he says, God has raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So Peter here is preaching on the day of Pentecost to this Jewish audience, this Jewish pilgrims there from all over the world, and they revere King David. But, but Peter stands up and he says, there is one who David refers to in Psalm 110.1 as my Lord. In other words, there's a, there's a greater king that has come. And, and listen, it's no surprise that Peter would, would refer to Psalm 110.1 because Peter's used to hearing Jesus preach. And Jesus had referred to Psalm 
Look at Mark chapter 12 and verses 35 and following. The Bible says, while Jesus was teaching in the temple, he asked, how can the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself says by the Holy Spirit, the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? <laughs> oh, there's, there's one is, who has come who is greater than David. <laughs> there is one who has come who is greater than the greatest of Israel's kings. There is one who has come who is the king of kings. And when you read the New Testament, what, what you see is the New Testament authors going back to, to Psalm 110 over and over again to fill out the portrait of the majesty and the greatness of Jesus. Let's, let's look at five examples of this. Jesus is, first of all, greater than angels. Greater than angels, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 1.13, now to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? It wasn't said about any angels, it was said of Jesus. Second, he is crucified and exalted. In Acts chapter five, again, the early believers here bearing testimony before the, before the Sanhedrin, and they say the God of our ancestors raised up Jesus, whom you had murdered by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Third, he is our intercessor and advocate. The apostle Paul says in Romans 8, 34, who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Again, Paul here is echoing the language of Psalm 110.1. Fourth, Jesus is seated in accomplishment. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 11 through 13, every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time after time, which can never take away sins. But this man, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. He is now waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. Again, another explicit reference to Psalm 110.1, that, 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 that Jesus, our high priest, is, is seated in, a, in accomplishment, right? He, the, 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 the other priests, they stand continually, but Jesus has sat down at the right hand of God. Why? Because his, of his finished work, because it's been accomplished. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. Fifth, he is returning and ruling Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 25, for he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. Again, another echo of Psalm 110, 1. And so we see over and over and over again, these New Testament authors are, are, are at times quoting, at other points explicitly referring to the language here of Psalm 110, 1 to, 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 to picture Christ in his exaltation and glory as king. And the oracle continues here in verse two. Let's look at it. David says, the Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. Rule over your surrounding enemies. Now, a king's scepter was the staff that they would hold, and, and, and their scepter symbolized their right to rule. And so again, all caps, this is Yahweh saying to Christ, the Father saying to the Son, I am, I am going to extend your rule. You are going to rule over your enemies. But listen, people need not be his enemies. God's heart is for his enemies to become his friends. So listen, this oracle is spoken over Jesus right after his ascension, but what did Jesus say just before his ascension? 
he gave us the great commission, right? Matthew 28 and verses 18 and following, Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. So the last thing that Jesus said to us, his marching orders to the church were what? Go and make disciples. Where? All nations, all peoples. Why? Because Christ is the rightful king of all peoples, of all the nations. Earlier in the series, when we looked at the other royal psalm in the series, Psalm 2, what did we see the, the, the father there saying to the son in Psalm 2, 8? Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. So listen, we go to the ends of the earth, and we send others to go to the ends of the earth through our giving and through our prayers and our support because Christ is the rightful king of all nations, of all peoples, of every tribe and tongue. The heart of God is for all peoples to know him as, because he is the only true king, the rightful king of all peoples. He is Christ the king. Second, we see in Psalm 110 that he is Christ the priest. Christ the priest. Let's, um, let's look at verse four of Psalm 110. The Lord has sworn an oath and will not take it back. You are a priest forever according to the pattern of Melchizedek. So what you see here in verse four is a second enthronement oracle. And again, it's Lord in all caps. This is Yahweh, right? This is the Father, again, speaking over his Son, speaking another enthronement oracle over Jesus. And, 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 and this time, what does he say? He says to him, you are a priest forever according to the pattern of Melchizedek. Now, Anybody ever been reading your, your Bible and you're confused by Melchizedek? <laughs> Sometimes when we, 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 we're, we'll be reading through Genesis, you know, maybe we started, a, uh, started to read through the Bible and we get to Genesis 14 and we come to this mysterious figure of Melchizedek, and it, it's, sometimes we're tempted to skip over sections like that, but we should not, um, because it's super important. So in Genesis 14, Abraham has just bailed out his, his troublesome nephew Lot, <laughs> which happens multiple times. And Abraham has this meeting with these kings. And one of the kings who's at this meeting is Melchizedek. So the, the, the name, the very name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. King of righteousness. And he's described there in Genesis also as the king of Salem. So, the, so Salem was like a forerunner of Jerusalem. Okay, so um, he's, he's king of righteousness. He's king of the city that would become Jerusalem. Uh, the, that word, uh, Salam, means peace. So he's a king of righteousness. He's a king of peace. He's king of the city of Jerusalem, but also Melchizedek is described there as a priest. And not just any priest. He is described there as, as a priest of, of God most high. We just sung those words earlier in the, in the service. So Melchizedek was a king and a priest. He was a king priest, a king slash priest. And the father says to Jesus, he says, you are a priest forever according to the pattern of Melchizedek. Because what is Jesus? We just saw in verse one and two 
that he's the king. But Jesus is also a priest who intercedes, who mediates on behalf of his people. And so he is, he is a priest according to the pattern of Melchizedek because he's a king priest. But in the case of Jesus, he is a king priest, what? He says, you are a priest forever, forever, according to the pattern of Melchizedek. Why? Because he has secured for us a forever salvation. Jesus is our high priest. He is at the right hand of God, not only ruling as our king, but interceding on our behalf as our great high priest. Now the writer of the book of Hebrews is all over this. When you read Hebrews, Hebrews 5, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 7, you see this language just sprinkled throughout those chapters. We're going to look at a few of those references. Let's look first of all at Hebrews 5 and verses 9 and 10. After he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And he was declared by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So here is the writer of Hebrews explicitly referring to Psalm 110.4. And then he says in chapter 6 and verses 19 and 20, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner because he has become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So, in the Old Testament, what did high priests do? They would go behind the curtain. They would enter into the, the tabernacle or later the temple. And they would go into the innermost part. The Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was surrounded by a thick curtain but the high priest would go behind the curtain and there he would do what he would offer the blood of of sacrifices animal sacrifices like the blood of lambs that had been sacrificed and he would confess there the sins of the people and his own sins but you see, now what has happened is that one who had no sin has been slaughtered as a lamb on our behalf. And Jesus himself has gone behind the heavenly curtain. And there he, he intercedes for us by means of his own shed blood. And so the final sacrifice has been made. He, he died for sinners. He was raised from the dead. He has ascended to the right hand of the Father. And there our great high priest, by means of his shed blood, and his final forever sacrifice is interceding for you and me at the right hand of God the Father. And he says to the Father, she's mine. She belongs to me. He's mine. He belongs to me. Look at Hebrews 9 and verses 25 and 26. He did not do this to offer himself many times as the high priest enters the sanctuary yearly with the blood of another. Otherwise, he would have had to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. But now, he has appeared one time at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. Praise God. For Jesus, our priest. 
He is Christ the king. He is Christ the priest. Third, he is Christ the warrior. Christ the warrior. Let's look at verses five and six of Psalm 110. David says, the Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his anger. He will judge the nations heaping up corpses. He will crush leaders over the entire world. Wow. The Bible is saying that there is coming a day when Christ returns as king and evil is going to be destroyed. There is coming a a, a day when when Christ returns and, and, and earthly leaders who were who had done evil, earthly leaders who used their power to crush the poor and the vulnerable will themselves be crushed by the king of kings. Because when Christ returns, he will return in judgment. Evil will be judged, it will be dealt with, it will be destroyed. He's going to return as warrior. Now the language here in verses five and six is similar to the kind of language that we see in in Revelation 19. Let's look at Revelation 19 and verses 11 and following. John says, then I saw heaven opened and there was a white horse Its rider is called Faithful and True, and with justice he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now listen, This is not the Jesus who appeared on the flannel grass in Backyard Bible Club, right? (laughs) This is not the Jesus who was was on the wall of of our kids' Sunday school classes, but but this Jesus is in the Bible. Because you see that when, when, when Jesus came the first time, at his first coming, he came in the most humble circumstances imaginable. He came as a little baby, as an infant, born to a couple so poor and so lacking in any influence that they could not even secure a room for him to be born in. And so he's raised in this poor, humble family in backwater Nazareth that hardly anybody had heard of. And even when Jesus begins his earthly ministry, the Bible says that he often had no place to lay his head. And he was despised and rejected by leaders, eventually arrested on false charges and subjected to a mock trial and spat upon and beaten and had a crown of thorns pressed down upon his head in mockery, and then taken outside the the walls of Jerusalem, there to be murdered in the most humiliating way possible. The entire point of crucifixion was not just death. The point of it was humiliation. That was his first coming. But see, now he has been raised. He has been raised and he has been exalted. He has ascended to the right hand of 
of God the Father Almighty. He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and he will return to judge the living and the dead. And you see, when Christ comes again, it will not be in humility. It will be as warrior. It will be as judge. It will be, it will be to destroy evil. The Bible says in Philippians 2 that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The issue is not whether our knees will bow before Jesus. That will happen. That will happen for every human being. The issue is when we hit our knees before Jesus on that day, will we we be bowing before our Savior or before our judge? It will be one of the two. And if you're bowing before your Savior, that'll be the moment when all of your hopes are fulfilled. But if you're bowing before your judge, that will be a moment of sheer terror. It need not be a moment of terror for you because you can know him as your savior. (laughs) Repent. Repent. Turn from trying to be your own king, the king of your life. Turn from sin and self, doing your life your way and turn to Christ as your king. Turn from sin and self. Turn to Jesus. Our Savior, our King, our Priest, our Warrior. Turn to Him and trust Him. Trust in His finished work that He died for sinners like you and that He rose from the dead and that He sits at the right hand of God and that He's returning. Give your life to Him. Trust your life into His hands. And when he comes again, you will bow before him as your savior. And he invites you to repent and to trust in him today, right now. Let's pray together. You may be here in this room and you need to know Christ. You may be watching this video and you need to know Christ Turn to him, repent of your sins, place your trust in him. Right now, welcome him into your life, receive him as your savior, your Lord, your king. Say, Lord, I give my life to you. I take my hands off of the controls of my life and I yield it to you, all of it. I give myself to you. You have the right to rule and to reign in my life. And if that's the prayer of your heart, we would love to come alongside you. We would love to talk with you. After our service, or just give us a call. You let us know. We would love to come alongside and encourage you in what it means to, to walk with Christ. If you're here today, and as a, as a believer, this, this is a passage that should give us a deeper and a richer understanding of our Savior, of, of who He is. But, but with that comes the responsibility to go and tell others. May we commit ourselves to going forth as His witnesses because the world needs to hear about our Savior. And that's going to come through us. And so, Father, we pray that You'd make us faithful to be your witnesses, to go forth and to, to, not, to not be ashamed of our Savior, but to be bold. Give us, give us the love for people that we need, for family members who are lost, for friends who are lost and in our lives. Give us the love for them and, and the boldness in the Holy Spirit to open our lips and to, to share the good news of Jesus with them. We pray for the nations. We know it's your heart to be known by every tribe and tongue. Christ is the rightful Savior and King, the only Savior and King of all peoples. Make us faithful 
to go as you call us to go, to, to send others, to give generously that others can be sent to the ends of the earth with the glad tidings of Christ. For it's in his name that we pray, amen.